Turn on. Okay, good evening everybody. Um, we might get started and I'd like to welcome you all, welcome you all to this uh, very special occasion. I'm Jeff Lindemann. Uh, I co-head the ACRF Stem Cells and Cancer Division across the road at uh, Wehi with Jane Visveda. And we're very pleased tonight to be able to, um, uh, uh, through Wehi and the ACRF, have this public lecture um, that's going to be given by Rob Sutherland. Um, the, the order of ceremonies basically is, is simple and straightforward so that you can actually enjoy the, 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 the main course, which is Rob Sutherland speaking. And we're going to have Greg Cam from the Board of Trustees of the Australian Cancer Research Foundation providing you with some background to, um, to how valuable their organisation is uh, for scientists around the country in terms of uh, uh, providing a lot of the nuts and bolts that makes research happen in this country and then Doug Hilton, the director of WeHi, um, to speak as well, and also Rob Sutherland. I might start by just asking uh, Mr. Greg Cram to come up and speak first. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I think uh, the, the name uh, Sonia McMahon uh, is well known to, uh, uh, to many Australians, and we lost her in, in 2010. Um, Lady McMahon, who always insisted on being called Sonia, uh, was quite a lady indeed. And she was with the Australian Cancer Research Foundation from day one. Uh, in fact, uh, she was there at the very beginning when, when the organisation was formed uh, 28 years ago and, and in fact uh, helped to form it. Uh, in 28 years, we've become Australia's largest uh, charity devoted to funding of, of cancer research and thanks to the foresight uh, and the wisdom of Sonia and her colleagues way back 28 years ago, um, we've got adequate investment income to cover all of our administration fees. So what we can claim, unlike we think most others, is that every single cent of every single dollar that's donated to the ACRF goes to research uh, into, into cancer. Now, Sonia was, uh, of, of course, a, a very famous and you've got to say glamorous uh, a figure in Australian society. Uh, she was also very charming um, and very witty, uh, and she was actually a lot, a lot of fun to be around. And I've got a very fond memory of her. One night after an ACRF function uh, in North Sydney, we, we, catched a, we caught a cab uh, together back over the Harbour Bridge. And uh, there were a lot of, a lot of, late at night, and a lot of guys were working on the bridge and painting and fixing things. And I made, I made a casual remark, something to the order of, gee, this bridge is getting old, isn't it? <clears throat> and she, uh, she said to me, well, actually, this bridge is exactly 75 years old. And that's not old, really, is it, Greg? <laughs> and uh, she told me two things without telling me. Uh, the first was, therefore, that she was born in 1932, the year that uh, the bridge was opened, um, and that 75 wasn't old. Uh, she, she, was so much, she was so much fun, and I have to tell you, I sat in the back of the cab smiling away for the rest of the, rest of the trip. Uh, and she'd be chuffed to know that this, this lecture tonight's being held in, in, her, uh, in her memory and her honour. She'd probably also be embarrassed. So on, on behalf of the, the board of the Australian Cancer Research Foundation, thank you uh, to the, to the WEHI for such a gracious gesture uh, tonight. And, and about uh, the WEHI and ACRF, well, uh, we've been working together for a long time, and in fact, we've provided uh, several grants to, uh, to WEHI, um, and in fact, to other uh, great uh, research uh, organisations around Melbourne and, and in Australia. And there's no question that we have some of the finest scientists in the world uh, right here. Um, we've, uh, in, in recent times, we've, we've made a, a grant of $2 million to the, the new Chemical, Biology and Stem Cells and Cancer Division of, of the WEHI. Uh, and this $2 million grant will allow the WEHI to build on their breakthroughs in breast cancer uh, and extend them to lung and ovarian cancer. Uh, the funding will help provide facilities and equipment it will maximise their chances of finding uh, new cancer medicines and, and treatments. Sonia would be thrilled uh, that, that this was happening in her honour, and, and I think it would be very, very nice if we could observe a minute's silence in her honour. Shows how long a minute can be, doesn't it? Um, uh, to continue uh, on a, or to finish on a positive note, there's one uh, final thing uh, that it's my very great pleasure to do.
uh, and that's to hand over the first instalment of that $2 million grant to Doug Hilton, the director of the WEHI. So here's a million dollars, Doug. Um, <laughs> As my mum used to say, don't spend it all at once and spend it wisely. Thank you. <laughs> Good on you, mate. Thanks, Greg. Um, David Brattel, uh, CEO of ACRF, Greg Cam, um, friends, colleagues and members of the public. Uh, it's wonderful to get the cheque. Thank you very much, David. Um, the ACRF and WEHI have had a very long relationship. Um, over the last 15 or so years, we've been privileged to receive uh, a number of grants from the ACRF that have really pushed our research forward. Um, I'm really delighted that we will have two ACRF divisions of research at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, the Stem Cells and Cancer and Chemical Biology divisions. Um, I think together those two divisions really capture where we want to go. We want to be able to make discoveries about the way uh, cancer begins and progresses and with the Chemical Biology division to be able to um, generate better treatments for cancer. So I think with those two aspirations, the ACRF's legacy will be uh, well satisfied. I'd also like to say a big thank you to Sonia McMahon and her vision that led to the creation of ACRF. I only met her on two occasions at ACRF functions in Sydney. Um, she was truly a force to be seen and to be reckoned with. She was an amazing woman. And finally, although Jeff is going to introduce Rob formally, I just wanted to say, Rob, I could think of no better inaugural uh, Lady Sonia McMahon lecturer. So thank you for coming. Thanks very much, uh, Doug, and I'd like to echo those words. I met Sonia McMahon at an ACRF function and um, was very impressed. I think she was wearing that a similar dress to the one she'd worn on the steps of the White House at, and even at a time she was older than the Harbour Bridge and it uh, suited her very well. Um, now, it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce uh, the, in, the inaugural speaker for this, uh, uh, the Sonia McMahon Lecture. It's uh, uh, Professor Rob Sutherland, who is the uh, director of the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and uh, the director of the Cancer Research uh, Program at the Garvin Institute. Um, Rob has a very long CV, um, and I'm going to bore you with some of it. Uh, he's uh, uh, published over 300 uh, uh, sem seminal papers in breast cancer and other areas in cancer research, and his work has been cited more than 17,000 times to give you some uh, flavour of uh, his relevance uh, to the cancer field. In 2002, to recognise his contributions, he was made a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. Um, in 2003, he received the Centenary um, Feder Federation Medal, and he was made a member, an officer of the General Division of the Order of Australia um, in 2010 to recognise his contributions to breast cancer research and the cancer field. And in the same year, he won the New South Wales Premier Award for Outstanding Cancer Researcher. So um, that's a reflection, I think, of uh, a very proud pedigree. Uh, f from my, my own perspective, he's really been a pioneer in breast cancer research. If, if Australia had to look at, um, to, to sort of uh, flatten the number of uh, living icons, I think we had seven um, living treasures announced yesterday. If we were to, to just look at breast cancer, there's no question that Rob would be up there at the front of the pack, although I'm not quite sure whether he'd be a Clive Palmer or a um, Kylie Minogue, but he'd certainly be there. Um, and he's got a very special role uh, for Victorians uh, who engage in cancer research because he played a very seminal role in helping to promote the Victorian Breast Cancer Research Consortium, which uh, was funded uh, about 14 years ago now by the state government and, and really kick-started breast cancer research in this country. And, and Rob's been a great advocate of that, a great supporter, and in fact, a great collaborator for many of the groups, um, something that I think many people have valued. And as you've heard, he's also made important commitments to the ACRF. So it's a great pleasure to, to introduce uh, Rob to, to speak and to, to give you some sort of vignette of um, the last 30 years or so of breast cancer research. <coughs> Thanks, Rob. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for those very, very kind words. Thanks, Doug. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to 
come to Melbourne. I've had the opportunity to speak several times uh, at the WEHI and very much enjoyed it. And this is a special occasion and, and I'm particularly honoured to be doing it in the sense that I've had a long-standing relationship with the Australian Cancer Research Foundation. Uh, I think I was on the Scientific Advisory Committee for about 20 years, which overlapped a lot with, uh, with Sonia and I got to know her well and she, what a fantastic advocate she has been. I actually had to get off so that I could get some money. Um, <laughs> You can't sit on the board and uh, sit on the committee and take money. So, um, fortunately, having uh, got off the board, we have got some money, and some of that money's gone into this building up here, which is the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. So, thank you, David, and the ACRF for a very significant contribution to that building. Um, so, let's move on with the presentation. Uh, putting a talk together that is for a sort of mixed audience is always a challenge. Uh, I've tried to do four things and I hope that the complexity which will increase as I get through it I think uh, won't be so great that even the lay people in the audience don't follow it. So what I'd like to do is just reflect a little bit on what's happened in breast cancer research particularly in the decrease in mortality that's happened in the last uh, 30 years which has been quite spectacular. Uh, what can we learn from that? Uh, where have we come and what can we learn from that? Uh, then I'd like to talk a little bit about the fact that breast cancer is not one disease, it's a spectrum of diseases and how can we get a handle on that and how will that help us better diagnose the disease and better manage the disease. And then in the latter part of the talk I'm just going to give two examples of pieces of work uh, from my colleagues at the Garvin and their collaborators in some potentially new approaches to uh, attempting to treat subtypes of breast cancer that have a particularly poor uh, prognosis and where at the moment there are no particular targeted therapies. So that's an overview. For those of you who are tired, you can now pop off to sleep and I'll give a summary at the end. And um, I'm going to use David Brattell as my monitor. When he starts nodding off, I'm going to know that I'm, I've gone too far. No, 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 I know you well, David. It's, it'll be just... Um... The first point I wanted to make really was just um, some data about the incidence and in, in, in mortality of breast cancer. And uh, these are just figures from New South Wales, but this is, as you all know, the most commonly diagnosed uh, cancer in women. One in 11 females will get a diagnosis, and it's the most common cause of death, uh, and significant numbers of death, and uh, significant numbers of lives lost uh, due to this disease, even though, as you'll see, we've made significant uh, decrease in mortality over the last uh, couple of decades. But still we're losing, on a national basis, about 2,500 women to breast cancer a year, you know, which is 50 a week, uh, which is seven a day. So it's still a very, very important disease. And whilst we've made some very significant progress, uh, we need to make more. So these figures that were reflected in, uh, in Australia are also reflected in the uh, US and, and the UK, where um, you can clearly see, I'll just try to point a couple of these things for you. So you can clearly see this rather impressive decrease in mortality both in the UK and in the US, which is similar to what we've seen in this country. So what's that about? Uh, the general consensus is that we can attribute this to screening mammography. Uh, everybody knows that in all cancer types, if you diagnose them early and treat the disease when it's hasn't spread, then you've got a higher likelihood of cure, and mammography has done that. Uh, but equally importantly, uh, understandings of better therapies for the disease. And with the introduction of adjuvant chemotherapy and adjuvant hormonal therapy or endocrine therapy, which is targeted, these have made very significant contributions to the decrease in mortality, and I'll show some data that reflect that. So the actual first discovery of a targeted therapy for breast cancer, the so-called uh, tamoxifen or Nolvadex, really rose serendipitously uh, through two lines of investigation. Uh, Elwood Jensen among, was am amongst a group of people who were interested in how does the female sex hormone estrogen work? And they worked mainly on experimental animals and the, the immature rat uterus was the favourite uh, target organ for study. And that led to the discovery of estrogen receptors, which are the molecules that recognise at the cellular level 
uh, estrogens. Now, Elwood happened to work in the Ben May Institute in Chicago where there was a history of interaction with the clinical team. Uh, Charles Huggins had previously been at that institution who won the Nobel Prize for hormonal therapy and prostate cancer some years before. So having done these studies in animals, uh, Elwood and his team along with some others looked in uh, human breast cancers and discovered that this estrogen receptor was present in the breast cancers. At the same time, uh, at ICI Pharmaceuticals, Arthur Walpole had developed a series of compounds that were actually specifically designed as uh, contraceptive agents. So they actually blocked estrogen action and blocked the implantation of uh, fertilised eggs into the um, into the, um, the uterus. And when Arthur saw this information that Elwood published in relation to estrogen receptors and breast cancer, he thought, oh, maybe one of these compounds would uh, do that. So they actually did a couple of really simple experiments. They uh, did a couple of experiments in baboons, uh, which were very specific for anti-estrogenic activity. And then they clearly showed that in primates, here was an anti-estrogenic effect. And then they did a study at the Christie Hospital in Manchester in about 1974, uh, which showed that uh, this drug actually inhibited the growth of metastatic breast cancer. And as they say, the rest is history. But this was the first targeted therapy for cancer in that there was a molecule in the cancer the drug was specifically active on. And so how does this drug work? Well, this uh, shows you a sort of cancer cell here. It's, uh, it's Proliferation is driven by this estrogenic molecule, recognised by the estrogen receptor that Elwood Jensen and others discovered. And by blocking with this anti-estrogenic agent, you inhibit the activity of the receptor. It can't exert its effects and it inhibits the cell proliferation. Now, more recently, we've got another class of agents which are called aromatase inhibitors, which essentially do the same thing. They're slightly more efficacious, uh, but they affect estrogen synthesis. So basically, they stop the production of estrogen, so there's no estrogen that can interact with the receptor and similarly inhibit uh, proliferation. And as I said, these agents were shown in the, in, in the, in the 70s to be efficacious, but we now have huge experience, and this is a meta-analysis of data done by the Early Breast Cancer Trials Cooperative Group showing the experience of uh, treating women after they've had a breast cancer, they're estrogen receptor positive, after breast cancer surgery, they're treated for about five years, five years of standard for tamoxifen. These are women who haven't been treated, these are women who have been treated. As you can see, the recurrence rate is markedly reduced, and similarly, the mortality rate is markedly reduced. And these are clearly very significant contributions to the decrease in mortality that we've seen in breast cancer therapy. So in summary, tamoxifen is the first receptor-targeted anti-cancer agent. Uh, it's standard care for uh, adjuvant treatment of ER-positive breast cancer across the board initially, but now with aromatase inhibitors coming on the scene and being a little bit more efficacious, they are often used in the, in the premenopausal situation. This is actually some data I borrowed off Craig Jordan. I think 500 is an underestimate, so he, he attributes that there's more than 500,000 women alive today because of their treatment with tamoxifen. And the other thing that I haven't shown you any data on is that in addition to actually being efficacious in the disease, it's also efficacious in inhibiting the disease. So there's some very nice studies done where women at high risk of developing breast cancer were given tamoxifen. One group were followed, certain number of cancers, other group who were treated followed, and there's about a 50% reduction in the incidence of breast cancer in uh, high-risk women who are treated with tamoxifen. So it's actually a preventive agent as well. However, this significant, um, like many cancer drugs, this significant uh, failure of the effic efficacy of the, of the agent, whether it be through intrinsic resistance, i.e. the tumour doesn't respond initially, or acquired resistance where the tumour does respond uh, initially, but then it uh, develops an, an ability to circumvent the resistance. So that was our first um, targeted therapy in breast cancer. And of course, in the, in the last couple of decades, we've got another one, which is Herceptin. And it targets another molecule called the 
HER2 or new or ERB2 oncoprotein. Now, this research developed out of research in the 80s where people found for the first time so-called oncogenes, which are genes that cause cancer, and later tumour suppressor genes, which are genes that inhibit cancer in their normal process. Now, this particular oncogene was shown to be overexpressed in some breast cancers uh, through gene amplification. This is a very ancient thing called a southern blot. What it tells you is the darker the black smear, the more amplification of that particular part of the genome that you have. And these data, there are small numbers of patients um, showing that if you have amplification of this gene, uh, then you do much worse. I saw Jake Martin in the audience there, so parenthetically I'll tell you a story. The reason that this experiment was able to be done was that Bill McGuire from San Antonio, who ran the biggest estrogen receptor assay lab in the US, used to have to homogenise his tissue to do the cytosolic assay for the estrogen receptor in a biochemical reaction. And he decided that he'd freeze this, the, the pellets. And I remember Jack and I were having dinner with him <laughs> one night and him telling us this. And we both sort of said, well, you know, why are you doing it? I mean, what's it going to, isn't it a, you know, what's, what's the, per oh, no, no, it'll be of use someday. It'll be of use someday. And sure enough, it was of use. And uh, so when uh, they, they wanted to look at this sort of material in clinical samples, they were able to actually get these pellets from the cytosol assays from Bill McGuire, who's a, who's a co-author on this paper, and Dennis Sloman pushed this project. Uh, subsequently, uh, Genentech developed an antibody to this uh, particular molecule, which is a cell surface molecule. Of course, today we don't use this sort of technology, but we can see the uh, evidence of amplification of uh, these loci in the, in, in the, um, in the DNA by uh, fish in the pathology lab. Um, I won't go into any great detail, just to tell you that Herceptin, which is the uh, therapy that targets this particular molecule, is a hybrid antibody, humanised antibody, and it binds to uh, these receptors of HER2 that are on the surface of cells, and it's signalling through those receptors and through various signalling pathways that drive the proliferation of those particular cells and give them a clonal advantage. And the antibody, there's some controversy about actually how the antibody works. It's thought to impede the cleavage of this receptor which is necessary for signal transduction. These are a family of receptors and they heterodimerize and the antibody is also thought to be able to inhibit their dimerization. It's also thought to be able to activate the immune system and, in, and encourage sort of tumour cell lysis and also to endocytose the receptor and downregulate it so it's no longer sensitive to the... So whilst it's not totally clear exactly how this drug works, it works, and it works well, and that's shown in the next slide where there's a similar sort of um, survival curve here for patients recurring with the disease. These are patients that have received trantuzumab or Herceptin, and these are the controls. And very much like the tamoxifen story you see here, after four years of... Uh, following treatment, the treatment's usually for one year, uh, you can see a very, very significant uh, decrease in uh, recurrence from the disease. And again, uh, this drug hasn't been in use all that long, but the data are now showing that in this decrease in recurrence is also uh, being reflected in a decrease in mortality. So there's a significant uh, contribution, I think, from this second targeted agent in the accumulating decrease in um, mortality that we're seeing from breast cancer. So a little summary of that section. So biomarker-directed therapy, so what I mean by that is that these patients who are treated with these targeted agents are selected based on some molecular aspect of their tumour, which is now just routinely diagnosed in a pathology department. Um, and those people, those patients who receive these therapies have got a significant decrease in mortality. And about 80% of breast cancers actually express either uh, the estrogen receptor or the HER2. Um, however, not all the patients respond. And so, again, this issue of um, resistance to therapies and mechanisms of resistance is a really challenging 
both laboratory and clinical problem in better management of the disease. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go through the presentation. The next thing I want to talk about is um, uh, phenotyping. So pathologists have known for decades that breast cancer is not one disease, but surgeons and medical oncologists initially when they were treating it thought it was one disease because they only had limited modalities in which to treat the disease. It's become clearly apparent and more apparent in recent years as we've got much more global tools for looking at uh, gene expression across the whole genome, etc. that we can start identifying these subtypes uh, in a more rigorous sort of way. So the research questions here then, and, and, and these are things that we've and many others have been involved in, is really how do you best identify the subtypes of breast cancer? And then once you've identified them, how do you modify or change, develop current therapies in a different combination or way to treat particular subtypes? Or identify subtypes where there really isn't any effective therapy and how can you use that as a basis for understanding the biology and developing uh, some new therapeutic approaches. So as I said initially, we thought breast cancer was one disease. Then when we found the estrogen receptor, we said it was two diseases. Uh, estrogen receptor positive disease, which is, was treated classically with tamoxifen and sometimes chemotherapy, depending on the grade of the tumours. And ER negative disease, which was unresponsive to this and uh, received conventional sorts of chemotherapies. And as I said, we started off measuring estrogen receptors in biochemistry departments and ligand blinding assays, and then subsequently again just routinely in a histopath lab identifying uh, ER positive from ER negative. Then with the um, sequencing of the human genome and an understanding of the number of genes that were expressed and tools uh, initially microarray studies to uh, measure global gene expression across a broad spectrum of tissues, uh, studies were undertaken which allowed uh, one to identify subgroups based on gene expression. And initially, uh, then the ER positives were divided into two groups, uh, lumen A, which were the highly estrogen uh, receptor positive estrogen responsive, which would be treated with tamoxifen aromatase inhibitors. Luminal Bs, which are also ER positive, but probably less responsive to these agents, uh, might add chemotherapy. The OB2 ones that were amplified, which I spoke about before, are clearly the target for Herceptin. And then a group out here called basal light breast cancers, uh, which were conventionally treated by chemotherapy and uh, where there's currently no uh, targeted therapies. And the important thing about these uh, subtypes is that they have quite different outcomes. So here's again a, a, a recurrence plot showing you that those uh, tumours that are identified as luminal A have a fairly good prognosis, whereas these groups here, the basals and the Herceptin, and the HER2s don't. And these data would be from patients where Herceptin had not been available and they weren't, or before Herceptin was available, they weren't treated. And this is just another group of uh, patients from other studies where there were data available showing essentially the same thing. So the luminal A's have a pretty good prognosis. Luminal B's, uh, although they're ER positive, uh, don't, don't do particularly well, and basals don't do uh, very well at all. Now, you're not supposed to memorise this um, or even understand what it is. It's just an aid memoir to me, and that is that this idea that there are subtypes of breast cancer is a bit of a moving feast. And whilst it's sort of interesting that you'll go to a lots of uh, conferences and hear people being quite dogmatic about the four categories that I just presented to you, here's a more recent study that was published by a French group uh, which is large and identifies six different subtypes. And interestingly, the HER2 subtype doesn't exist in their particular classification. They have three types of luminals. They have an apocrine uh, version, etc. So I, I don't think I can say any more about that, but the point I want to get across to you is that um, these things are not set in concrete. And that's perhaps not surprising. The disease is heterogeneous. <laughs> 
it may be a bit of a continuum rather than putting things in boxes. However, putting them in boxes is actually, I think, at this point in time, really quite helpful. Um, so trying to put them in boxes is also a, a, a challenge in the sense that uh, most of the original data was done on gene arrays, which are an expensive and cumbersome technology for a routine sort of clinical department. So one of the things that a number of groups have been doing, and we've been involved in this, is trying to find surrogate markers, simple immunohistochemical markers of these disease phenotypes. And these are some studies of our own where we, I, I won't go into any detail on what the markers we use, but with a, a panel of five markers in our own sort of cohort of patients, we were able to replicate as other people were, the sorts of things that you saw on gene arrays. You could identify a luminal A group that was you know, doing pretty well. You could identify luminal Bs that were somewhere in between, and you could identify a basal and HER2 group uh, that were essentially uh, doing considerably worse. And then we, in order to try and refine these categories, we just asked a couple of simple questions about uh, genes that we were familiar with and we thought were intimately involved in uh, defining these processes. So the first ones we looked at were receptors for estrogen and progesterone, and then we looked at a series of cell cycle genes that are involved in controlling how estrogen drives cell proliferation. And there's just some simple points to make, and they've been made by others as well, and that is that when you compare luminal A with luminal B, there is a decrease in the in the amount of estrogen receptor that's there. That's one of the factors that may contribute to their poor outcome. Uh, interestingly, progesterone receptor, which is a sort of surrogate marker of estrogen action, is thought to mirror that, but in our series we didn't see a significant difference, although maybe with bigger numbers we would have. Cyclin D1, is a, and I'll return to this later, is, a, is an oncoprotein that's very intimately involved in how estrogen drives cell proliferation. And we know that it's estrogen regulated, so this in a sense mirrors that. It's a, this is a reflection of the fact that it's an estrogen target gene. Whereas another uh, cyclone which is very important in, in, in cell proliferation is interestingly specifically upregulated in basal breast cancers and is a, quite a good marker of basal compared with the other phenotypes. Um, other things that we looked at were two cyclones that are involved at the other end of the cell cycle in DNA synthesis and mitosis and really are probably reflections of the proliferation rate of the tumour. And what you can see here again is that the luminal A ones in both uh, measures uh, are, are, are more proliferative. And finally, looking at P53, another interesting fact to emerge from our studies was the fact that P53 uh, overexpression, which is supposed to be a surrogate of mutation, and we can have that debate later, uh, is significantly increased in luminal Bs. And the purpose of this work was then to try and use some of these additional markers to see whether we could better refine these different subgroups of breast cancers. Um, and indeed, uh, you can. This is a study uh, of Ewan Millers, who's a pathologist who works with us. This is a, a group of patients that were put together by Peter Graham, who's a radiation oncologist. This is a trial of radiation boost to the cavity where the breast lump was removed. The trial itself did not show any effect of the boost, but it's a very well documented set of early breast cancer patients who have been well documented and well followed up. And by refining our categories of these luminal A's and luminal B's, so luminal A here is the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor. There's a marker called KI67, which is a measure of proliferation rate. It's low. Uh, HER2 is absent, and P53 is absent. In the luminal Bs, to previous studies, we added P53 and this proliferation marker, and that gave us a, a better definition of luminal B, I believe, and the HER2 are these ones that are HER2 positive, but not ER positive, and these are the basal group. And whilst they're a very good group of patients, you can see again that this uh, luminal A group is really doing exceptionally well, and uh, the luminal Bs are still merging with the other poor uh, phenotypes. So what's the sort of importance of that? Well, there's a lot of debate, and there are a couple of editorials in the latest uh, issue of the Journal of Clinical Oncology, one by Dan Hayes and one by the people from the International Breast Cancer Study Group, arguing about whether or not there are a group of women 
who have such highly estrogen responsive breast cancer that you only need to treat them with endocrine therapy. They don't need any chemotherapy. Now that happens quite a lot in this country, but in the US, everybody gets chemotherapy. Or, um, so it's, 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 it's a significant debate. And of course, if you're going to get a maximal response from the targeted therapy, why would you add a therapy that's cytotoxic with significant side effects if you didn't have to? So actually defining this group is really quite important. And just have a look here. These are the 10-year actuarial survival rates for this lot. So, so you've only got a sort of 3% uh, mortality rate in this group, the luminal A's, as, as defined by the measures that I showed you. And the other three groups are all equally sort of poor in their prognosis. So clear differentiation between the two. But this looks like a group, and we think with some other genes we can actually refine it a little bit more, uh, is a group of women that do not uh, need chemotherapy. Um, and when you put this into a multivariant analysis with pathological parameters, we previously, in doing this subtyping, had identified that um, the actual molecular phenotypes weren't any better than your classical pathology of how many, what's the tumour size, what's the tumour grade, how many lymph nodes are involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but when you refine this a bit more, you find that, in fact, um, these parameters like luminal B are independent predictors of outcomes. So this is starting, I think, to, to define subgroups that clearly have a statistically important contribution to outcomes. So just to summarise here the, 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 the section on phenotyping. So um, panels of, simple panels of four or five uh, markers can actually start identifying these groups. These can be done routinely in a clinical pathology lab. Um, I made the point that the subtypes aren't necessarily stable, so there's still quite a bit of work to be done in that area. Um, and it's an open question about how much uh, new prognostic information you get, but I think from the last data set I showed you, I think that uh, we feel that, and others feel that they're making some significant progress. And what it did identify as well is that there are some very poor uh, outcome groups, including the luminal bees and the basal-like, that really do require uh, new therapies. Um, and I'm going now to talk then a little bit about how you might uh, attack some of these luminal B or endocrine resistant cancers. Um, so I said before that a lot of the ER positive tumours won't respond to the drug initially or will develop acquired resistance and this is thought to represent up to about 40% of ER positive cancers. So our team, along with many others, and this is supposed to scare you, um, have worked for many years trying to understand mechanisms of endocrine resistance. This is just a, a, a slide that's taken out of a review that Liz Musgrove and I wrote a couple of years ago. And what it is there to illustrate is that this is very complex and that there isn't just one mechanism of resistance and that the many different mechanisms of resistance that have been identified in experiments in the laboratory don't necessarily translate to what's happening in the clinical samples. Um, and you have aberrations in the estrogen receptor and its pathways. Uh, you have upregulation of growth factor pathways that actually circumvent the need for estrogen and driving cell proliferation. And there are other stress responses mediated through the NF kappa B pathway that also impact on these two endpoints, which is increasing proliferation in the absence of estrogen, so driving the cells without the need for estrogen and uh, inhibiting apoptosis. And I'm just going to dwell for a, a minute on the different ways in which uh, people have addressed this question and just show you one example from our own work of what we've tried to do. So, you know, there are a plethora of technologies and approaches for doing science these days. Uh, you can't do everything, uh, but in terms of this particular um, question, there have been some very nice pieces of work done uh, in, in a number of different ways. It's just simple hypothesis testing based on known biology, and, and I'll show you some data on, on cell cycle regulation. People have looked at clinical samples and done gene expression <coughs> profiles on tamoxifen sensitive versus tamoxifen resistant tumours to try and get a handle on uh, disease, uh, molecules and path gene networks that are involved in the process. Uh, functional annotation, I'll show you an example of that. And then more recently, this uh, really powerful tools that are available for doing functional genetic screens on a whole genome uh, basis, both gain of function uh, screens and loss of function screens. And 
Liz Musgrave and her team have been doing quite a lot of work in that area uh, with a lot of frustration and a little bit of success. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'll just give you this one example of um, looking at a hypothesis testing approach to this. So a very, very long time ago, I think the original papers were published in 1981 when we didn't know much about how tamoxifen worked. Uh, we discovered that in this cell cycle which drives cell proliferation, which we knew estrogen was driving and the anti-estrogen was inhibiting, we found that the anti-estrogen only worked in a very small part of the cell cycle. So if this is a 24-hour cell cycle, there's just a window in here, sort of four to six hours where the drug worked. Um, and we hypothesised, once people started understanding how the cell cycle worked, we hypothesised that what was happening here was that estrogen was driving these molecules that drive G1 progression and that anti-estrogens were inhibiting it. And we published a, a whole series of papers in the mid-90s that essentially supported that. And the key molecules in that process are uh, a number of oncoproteins, one C-MIC, uh, one cyclin D1, and another one cyclin E. And when I say they're oncoproteins, if you take those genes individually and express them in a mammary gland, the favourite model of Jeff and Jane, you will actually generate tum mammary tumours just by the single presence of that gene. So they're very important. Now what they do is they form, the cyclins form complexes uh, and they, these are enzyme complexes which then phosphorylate a, a gene called the retinoblastoma protein which is actually inhibiting cell progression uh, through the cell cycle. So basically activation by estrogen of these cyclins forms complexes, phosphorylates RB, the uh, cells progress. Our argument would be then, well, if you overexpress these things, then the cells will be less sensitive to anti-estrogens, and we've done that, and that's indeed the case. Um, and that a significant part of anti-estrogen resistance in the clinic may be manifest uh, by this. And we've, I'm not showing you the data, but we've um, got a number of studies that have shown that c -MIC, cyclin D1, and the two E cyclins are overexpressed in breast cancer and do co-segregate with tumours that don't, um, uh, don't respond so well to tamoxifen. Um, this is again for light relief, and there'll be a question on what's the most important molecule there. Um, this, is, this is addressing the question by the same approach, but it's one of those global approaches. So we've said, we have no prejudice as to what these genes might be. We're going to look at the whole set of genes that are expressed that are regulated by estrogen and put them in categories. And when we did that, we found that estrogen-induced families of genes that controlled cell growth, cell cycle, apoptosis, and transcription. And this is just the gene network for uh, the cell cycle. And the only reason I'm showing it is that those molecules that we had come out of our hypothesis testing approach also appeared in the global approach, which was encouraging in the sense that uh, we hoped we were getting on the right track. And what this um, cell cycle gene network shows you is that genes that are regulated by estrogen are involved in the mechanics of DNA replication, these pools here, or in the control of replication. So the biology uh, sort of uh, stood up reasonably well. And from that we've developed a model, and again there won't be a test on it, and uh, I always like the comment of Bob Weinberg who says just because it's a model doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, and this is a summation of a whole lot of work that's been done in the lab for ages. But what it shows you is that you know, estrogen, as I said, activates these oncoproteins, one c meg one cyclin B1. They end up uh, through a series of events that we don't need to do, discuss in detail by activating two enzyme complexes, which is one, which is cyclin ECDK2, and through activation of their own complex through CDK4 here, they also lead to upregulation of the cyclin E2 in another active complex. So in response to estrogen, you get uh, three active enzyme complexes which are driving the cell proliferation. And the hypothesis again was, well, those molecular processes ought to be upregulated in endocrine resistance. Uh, and if you knock out those genes, you should inhibit endocrine resistance. And again, uh, that was what we essentially happened and we've published much of that work. Uh, but what it does introduce is a possibility of attacking these things with new therapeutics. So there's a class of therapeutics called CDK inhibitors, and they block these particular 
enzymes, and clearly we wanted to test the hypothesis, would these agents actually inhibit uh, endocrine resistance? Uh, these are just a couple of cell lines. This, one, this one's endocrine resistance in the sense that um, whilst this cell line, its parent, is sensitive to the growth inhibitory effects of tamoxifen, uh, the uh, resistance cell line is not. This is another structure with different anti-estrogen. Uh, it's not as effective, but it's attenuated to some extent. But we were interested particularly in that. And we then took a series of CDK inhibitors uh, and I'm only showing the slide just to illustrate for you that these class of cancer drugs have been uh, being pursued over the last decade, and as you'll see from the slide, if you can read it, is that there's several of these agents have got through into phase one, phase two clinical trials and are starting to show some efficacy in the treatment of cancer, but not in breast cancer. So the question was, you know, here are some existing, a bit like the tamoxifen story, here are some existing agents that are showing anti-cancer activity. Would they be suitable uh, in our situation? And when you, we took one that was a CDK2 inhibitor, one that was a CDK4 inhibitor, uh, the takeaway message is when you add them together, they're, they're probably additive, and that the uh, they're equally efficacious in the resistant as they are in the wild type cell line. So these are potentially uh, agents that uh, may be efficacious in um, endocrine resistant breast cancer. So just to summarise that section, the cyclins are overexpressed in, in, in resistant disease. Uh, the CDK complexes, the enzyme complexes are activated. Um, the inhibitors are efficacious in a couple of examples of tamoxifen resistant cell lines in culture, and that further preclinical experiments in both the lab and in laboratory animals should inform us a little bit more about what are potential biomarkers for the efficacy of those agents and help us design clinical trials that we might be able to test their efficacy in humans. So finally, I'm going to talk briefly about another project. Uh, those of you who are at Lawn will have heard Alex Swarbrick talk about this. This is a, a project that Alex and Sandy O'Toole have been pursuing. Uh, we've looked at a number of candidate genes, um, some with Stephen Fox, some with um, uh, Christina Mitchell and other people around the country who've collaborated with us, uh, looking at potential molecules that might be candidate genes uh, for uh, targeting into um, this basal-like breast cancer phenotype. And I'm going to talk about developmental genes today um, amongst that group of candidates and specifically uh, the hedgehog pathway. But also through global approaches, um, we're getting a better insight into the molecular makeup of these diseases. So my colleague, uh, Roger Daly, uh, is uh, fascinated by receptors tyrosine kinases and phosphoproteomics and did a, a lovely study on cell lines, not on tissue. Uh, which identified a number of kinases that are upregulated specifically in the basal phenotype, uh, including a, a number of members of the Sark family um, of kinases. And of course, genomics is uh, uh, the technology of the immediate future. And uh, whilst we've had data on you know, transcriptomes and uh, copy number variants, uh, there are a number of large international projects now that are actually sequencing the whole genomes of breast cancer. Uh, my understanding is that there are four papers that will be published in Nature back to back sometime in the next few weeks or months which are documenting uh, breast cancer in much more detail than we've seen before. Um, so that will give us a, a bit more of an idea of the huge spectrum of changes that can occur in the genome in the evolution of cancer and may aid us in identifying both further subtypes of cancer but also uh, potential therapeutic targets. But I won't dwell on that. I'll just tell you a little bit about um, these developmental pathways uh, that are important in, in, in mammary gland development and stem cell self-renewal. Uh, many of these were discovered in more primitive organisms, hedgehog, for example, and Drosophila. And there's increased evidence that these genes are actually dysregulated in, uh, in breast cancer and may, again, be targets for new therapies. And the first thing we looked at, this is work of Sandy O'Toole, who's a pathologist who had actually been at Hopkins with her husband on a, he was on a postdoc, uh, 
And at that time, there was a lot of really nice work going on at Hopkins on the hedgehog pathway and hedgehog inhibitors, particularly in small cell lung cancer. Uh, Neil Watkins, who's now at Monash, uh, was there at the time and did a lot of that work. Anyway, what Sandy did was she took some of the nice uh, breast cancer tissue we've got and looked at the expression of sonic hedgehog in uh, normal ducts, in uh, dysplasia, and in various grades of uh, DCIS in cancer. And she had a test cohort, which were, it's an in-house cohort we'd prepared many years ago, and one she prepared herself uh, from specimens at Prince Alfred Hospital. And what it shows you is that this particular molecule uh, called sonic hedgehog is increased in its expression as the disease progresses. And that's common of a lot of genes that are intimately involved clearly in that process. You'd see the same thing for cyclone D1, you'd see the same thing for MYC, uh, etc. And importantly, uh, she was able to show that when you look at the effect of these overexpressors, uh, what, what, what sort of a phenotype do they show? Well, clearly they show a phenotype that has a, a poorer prognosis. And for the purpose of this discussion, when you look at the expression of this hedgehog molecule across the subtypes, you find that it is enriched predominantly in basal-like uh, <coughs> breast cancers. So, so that led Alex Warbrick, who runs one of the groups in the cancer department at the Garvin, to investigate this thing in an animal model. So what Alex did was he, he made cell, mouse cell lines that were overexpressing uh, the hedgehog uh, ligand and transplanted them into the fourth mammary gland of mice. And this just summarised what you see. Well, the tumours grow faster. Uh, you can see here that some of the tumour is um, in, the, in, the, in the lymph. It has uh, moved into the lymph uh, ducts. Uh, they grow more aggressively. As you can see here, here's a, here's a control. Here's a, a, a tumour that's sort of locally invading. Uh, they are much less differentiated, so this is the wild type tumour. You can still see glandular structure. This is a much more uh, undifferentiated tumour. And these are markers of, of cell proliferation, so these tumours also um, grow much more uh, rap rapidly. And interestingly, uh, he was able to show that if you overexpress the ligand in the cells and put them in cell culture, it actually, there's no phenotype. The cells don't grow faster. They don't invade in invasion ashlays, etc. But when you put them into animals and look at readouts, these, you don't need to know what these are. These are just readouts of sonic hedgehog action. You can see here that clearly when uh, it's done in an intact animal that you see a response in the tumour. And after quite a lot of work, uh, what they've come up with is a model, and again, because it's a model doesn't mean it's wrong, is that the carcinoma cell is producing high concentrations of this hedgehog ligand, which is essentially not having any direct effect on the cancer cell itself. It's affecting cells in the stroma and specific cell types that have yet to be identified uh, and activating those. And those cell types then uh, have the readout for hedgehog action and produce growth factors that feed back onto the tumour cells and lead to proliferation. And this then uh, uh, leads to the opportunity that if you either interfere with this, and I'll show you some experiments with an antibody that interferes with that, or you interfere with um, some of the downstream targets of hedgehog signalling, you may very well have again some sort of effective uh, therapy. So this is a very simple experiment. These data were published last year. These are mice growing those tumours uh, in the presence of an antibody that blocks the ligand. And in the presence of that antibody, you get uh, significantly reduced uh, tumour growth. And you get significantly reduced metastasis. So this particular tumour model, it, it metastasizes to the pancreas, to the liver, to the lung, uh, and in the pancreas, uh, every mouse had um, uh, pancreatic mets after a certain period of time, whereas the antibody treated ones didn't. And in the liver mets, they were reduced by about 75%. So, just to conclude, because time is nearly up, um, in the sort of global research that's been done on basal 
uh, like breast cancers, and I know Jeff and Jane have done a lot of work in this area as well, many people have identified uh, new potential targets uh, that might be uh, useful therapeutic, um, new, thera new therapeutic targets. Um, how those progress will be interesting, and we'll see that over the next few years. Uh, one of the advantages of hedgehog is, in the same way as the CDK inhibitors were available, there are a number of hedgehog inhibitors that have been used in, uh, in trials and other uh, cancer types uh, that are currently available, and Alex and his team are uh, working with Novartis to get a bit more preliminary clinical data with the uh, goal of having a, a, a trial of, of, of some of these therapies in uh, basal-like breast cancers in the not-too-distant future. Um, and I think, really, uh, that's uh, about as much as I, I want to say. I just hope that you got the take-home message that um, we, that is the community, work on breast cancer, and it's a very large community, have clearly made some progress, uh, significant decreases in mortality. And the nice thing about that is it actually, they're paradigms for improving it further, in my view. So the two examples that I showed you of tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors in the estrogen receptor and Herceptin on the B2 receptor uh, are, are very clear paradigms for future ways of identifying molecules that are critical to the carcinogenic process and the progression of the disease and specifically targeting with therapeutics to get a therapeutic gain and um, benefit to patients and their families. Uh, the second point I made was that this is a heterogeneous disease. As I said, the pathologists have known that for a very long time. And within the categories that I identified for you, there's also significant heterogeneity. So in the basal, like breast cancers, which are probably only 15% of breast cancers, there's the BRCA12 phenotype, there's several other phenotypes. And so I think what's coming also out of, the, out of the genome sequencing in cancer is that instead of having big groups of patients, 20% here, 30% there, that you can treat in a specific way, it may be that there are lots of small subtypes of cancers where only 3% of that tumour type have that particular mutation that is targetable. And it makes you think a little bit differently about cancer because that particular mutation may be present in some lung cancers and some ovarian cancers. So instead of looking at cancer as an organ-specific disease, which is what we've done for most of the time in, in breast cancer and we're still doing, we need to think of the molecular pathology or the genetic pathology of cancer across the board and start thinking more about molecular pathology and saying all cancers with this mutation irrespective of where they come from, uh, can be treated with this particular agent. And I think that's one of the very exciting things about where we're going is that there have been a lot of agents gone into uh, testing over the last 10 years, and many of them are efficacious in small numbers of certain diseases. So that when you identify the mutation then in breast cancer, you would be able to very quickly, if you can get enough patients, take that particular therapy from there and test it in your particular case maybe. Um, with some further advances. So I'll just conclude there by, uh, there are far many more people than I represent on this slide have been involved in this work because as Jeff said earlier, we have lots of collaborations uh, across the board, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, these people who are pathologists and medical oncologists who done most of the work on the phenotyping of the breast tissue, particularly you and Miller. Um, uh, Liz Musgrave and her team have worked on the cell cycle CDK aspects of the work, uh, Roger Daly and his phosphoproteomics and the basils, Alex Warburg and the hedgehog pathways have collaborated with Neil Watkins who's been a, a great assistance to he and Sandy in moving that project forward and then to various sources of uh, very important well annotated tissue that allow us to do uh, some of the studies that we've been able to do. And on that note, I've gone a little bit over time. I'd just like to thank you very, very much for um, your attention and for inviting me to come. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for a really wonderful seminar that I think gives us a taste of personalised medicine to come and uh, some of the sense of trials and tribulations that can take many years for these things to come to fruition. We do have time for perhaps one or two questions. Um, uh, if Rob's got yeah, yeah, I'm happy, happy to. to. Thanks.
given that you say that 80% of breast cancer is like estrogen and set of positive, it would be really interesting to know what percentage um, have high KI67 um, positivity. And at the last account, that wasn't routinely being tested in Australia. What's the situation today? Well, the situation is that, I mean, this has been pushed, as you probably know, by Mitch Dowsett at the Marsden for some years. Um, there was, a, in the last 12 months, a JCO article on the standardisation recommendations for KI67 testing across the board. Um, I'm not aware of... You guys might be with Peter Mac people doing it, but um, I'm not aware of any labs that are doing it routinely in a... In a, in a diagnostic pathology sense. Um. So uh, it, it's something that probably should be ready for prime time, but it's, it's as you saw in the talk, there, there tends to be a lag. It's, it's at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, for example, we've started to measure KR67, so it is beginning to happen. Um, it, the, these things have a lag time in terms of uh, the, their clinical utility, whereas as you can see, the you know, the, the elegant uh, ways that they can fractionate things at the research level. And for Royal Melbourne, are you testing all women with breast cancer currently um, newly diagnosed, newly treated for KI67, or are you certain? Well, we, um, when, when we open our, our new building, the, the, the King Hong Cancer Centre, in uh, the middle of the year, um, we'll start doing things a little bit differently, and so some of those sort of research tests we will, in our evaluation, routinely measure them on all the patients that go through. Um, but then, you know, I mean, Jeff's right. I mean, there's the, the unfortunately the degree of rep, uh, validation, etc., that has to be done to actually get it into uh, clinical prime time is takes longer than you'd hope. What's exciting, sorry, I might just say, what's exciting about um, large centres coming together is that these are the sorts of things which are now feasible. So, for example, at the Kinghorn or here in the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre, these are the sorts of things that people will be looking at prospectively and, and basically looking for these um, sorts of markers that you've heard about in a much more comprehensive fashion so that we can get both a retrospective sense and a prospective sense of where things should go. We have completed, we've just completed a, a study on a, two of the IVCSG, that's the International Breast Cancer Study Group cohort, so something like 700 <coughs> plus patients. And we haven't written that up, we're in the process of writing that up, but that will illustrate again the importance of this in differentiating particularly luminal A's from luminal B. So that type of retrospective data is just more ammunition to get people testing prospectively. Uh, since Jeff and I are both on the ANZ Breast Cancer Trials Group's uh, Scientific Advisory Committee, we might be able to convince some of our colleagues there to start implementing this. Because I think it is important. Oh, yes, it is. It is addressed. I mean, I think that um, clinicians are ac acutely aware of this and, and um, increasing use of aromatase inhibitors also, you know, doesn't have that particular side effect. The interesting thing about tamoxifen and one of the reasons why it's such a good drug is it's not actually totally an anti-estrogen. It's a estrogenic in some fields and not in others, and so it has a protective effect on, on bone, which is beneficial, which aromatase inhibitors clearly don't, um, but there is this adverse side effect where it does encourage endometrial cancer. And, uh, and I'm talking about not just where it encourages endometrial cancer, but in the woman who already, oh, who already has it, but it should be count, counter-indicated, surely. There was a question up the back there, I think. Fifty years ago, we used to do a radical mastectomy for cousin over the breast. It then went up the segmental and the lower and the reduced resection. Double barrel question. What would happen if we did a radical mastectomy and did also the, the ancillary therapy with these people? My second, second part of that question would be is there a group of these, a subgroup of these people who would benefit from a radical mastectomy where we're doing a conservative and then losing out with our subsequent therapy? Uh, it takes me back a while. Um, no, it's a good question. 
I remember when I, when I first ever went to breast cancer conferences, uh, that's what people argued about, how radical did the mastectomy have to be to cure the disease. I think there's subsequent, you know, Italian studies showing lumpectomy versus... Uh, the radicals was overwhelming in the conclusion that uh, it wasn't necessary in most uh, cases. Um, if you've been doing this, you'll have a better idea of it than myself in terms of how many recurrences you get that then subsequently require a radical mastectomy. I, I don't know that. I, I guess my take on this is that we've learned so much about the biology of the disease that, um, in a sense, the surgery is necessary, but um, that the extent of the surgery is much more of a technical question. It's really exploiting the biological characteristics of a tumour. Um, so in some cases that may mandate a mastectomy, but really with the sorts of elegant biology you've heard about today, it's really taking those pathways out which are going to make a big difference. Uh, question up the back there. Um, is there research targeting the biology of metastatic breast cancer? Yes. Um, I mean, we, we, it, my own experience is that we have not done a lot of that research because we were interested in the early events and we were of the sort of philosophical view that if we could get at the early events, that wouldn't happen. A bit naive, really. But, um, so after 20-odd years, we actually now have people who are working on the metastatic process and there now seems to be potential targets that are specific genes that are involved in metastasis, uh, various biological processes like the interaction between the stroma and the epithelium that facilitate this and potentially pr provide us with targets that will inhibit that process. So we're still faced with metastatic disease and uh, we need to... A lot of people living with it. Exactly, yeah. Um, any other questions? Doug, do you have a... There's one question. Yeah, I was probably following on from the earlier points, but can you say or maybe somebody can speak with regards to the visual see using technologies like all can I just make a comment? There's a recent paper, again in the JCO, by Jack Cusack, Mitch Dowsett, and a few others who have done very rigorous studies of what uh, simple immunohistochemical chemical markers side by side with Oncotype DX. And the conclusion is that if you measure ER, PR, HER2 and KI67, it gives you as much prognostic information as Oncotype DX. Uh, 200 bucks versus 3,000. Um, it's a no-brainer. We might draw it to close because of time, but I'd like you all to thank uh, Rob again for a really elegant and exciting <laughs>